Along with the belief most people have that they naturally know how to think is an underlying correlating assumption that thinking doesn't require much effort or time. While we are fortunate to live in a society that allows the efficient use of our time in everyday living, such as being able to pick up dry cleaning and a meal along the same route on our way home, we have come to expect results to be as quick as service at a fast food restaurant. We are encouraged to use our time efficiently, but we seldom take the time to think efficiently. As a result, many people show little interest in contemplation. They wouldn't think of going on a long automobile trip without consulting a map and deciding which route to take. But in their psychosocial spiritual journey through life, they rarely stop to think about why they're going where they're going, where they really want to go, or how best to plot out and facilitate the journey. In this simplistic approach, we often overlook various aspects of our lives that are desperate for attention until they become full-blown crises. Or we dismiss new ideas that could further our growth simply because they do not fit in within the general framework of our preconceived notions and self-concepts. An enormous amount of time is spent simply reacting we must acknowledge that thinking well is a time-consuming process. We cannot expect instant results. I consider one of my identities to be that of an efficiency expert. Both as a psychiatrist and as a writer, I have worked to help people live their lives more efficiently, not necessarily to be happy or comfortable all the time, but rather to learn as much as possible in any given situation and get the most out of life. When you are efficient, you can accomplish more things in a shorter time span. In thinking efficiently, you learn how to prioritize what's important in order to face life's difficulties head on, rather than pretend they are inconsequential. Efficiency necessarily includes discipline. Being disciplined involves an ability to delay gratification as well as a willingness to consider alternatives. On the other hand, thinking simplistically leads you to make undisciplined, knee-jerk responses rather than considering choices that would lead to wise and productive decisions. To think well demands the integration of multiple dimensions in order to see the whole picture. It is the essence of thinking with integrity. The word integrity comes from the noun integer, which means whole, entire, complete. To think and ultimately to act with integrity, we have to integrate the multiple reasons and dimensions of our incredibly complex world. We psychiatrists have a verb for the opposite of integrate to compartmentalize. It means to take things that are properly related and stick them in separate airtight compartments in our minds, where they don't have to rub up against each other and cause us any stress or pain, friction or tension. If you want to think with integrity and you are willing to bear the pain involved, you will inevitably encounter paradox. The prefix para is Greek meaning by the side of, past, beyond. Doxa means opinion. Thus a paradox refers to a statement contrary to common belief, or one that seems contradictory, unbelievable, or absurd, but may actually be true in fact. If a concept is paradoxical, that itself should suggest that it smacks of integrity and has the ring of truth. Conversely, if a concept is not in the least paradoxical, you may suspect that it has failed to integrate some aspect of the whole. The ethic of rugged individualism is an example. Many fall prey to this illusion because they do not or will not think with integrity. 
For the reality is that we do not exist either by or for ourselves. If I think with any integrity at all, I have to recognize that my life is nurtured by the entire fabric of family, society, and creation. I am not solely an individual. I am interdependent, and much of the time I do not even have the right to act ruggedly. To understand paradox ultimately means being able to grasp two contradictory concepts in one's mind without going crazy. As a psychiatrist, I do not use the word crazy in a flippant way. It can actually make people crazy when something they have taken for granted to be true, and the only truth, comes into question. It is certainly a skill of mental acrobatics to juggle opposing ideas in one's mind without automatically negating or rejecting the reality of one or the other. But even when the greatest impulse is to deny something that one finds hard to digest, such as the fact that evil coexists with good in our world, the ability to understand paradox is necessary in the process of sorting through illusions, half-truths, and outright lies. It is unquestionable that certain changes are needed in society to encourage better thinking. But at the same time, each individual is responsible for his or her own thinking and how to meet this challenge. Ultimately, if we can teach people to think well, we could heal most of the ills of individuals and most of the ills of society. The point of thinking well is to become more conscious, which in turn is a prerequisite for solving problems well. But what is consciousness? And why is it the point? Consciousness is, among many other things, including love, prayer, beauty, and community, that are too large, complex, and mysterious to submit to any single adequate definition. That there is no single adequate definition of consciousness is not surprising. For the most part, we can define only those things that are smaller than we are. I believe that all those things too large for a single simplistic definition, including consciousness, ultimately have something to do with God. That is why, for example, the Muslims have a prohibition against any image of God, since it could not capture or define God, but would only represent a tiny segment of the whole, and hence would be, in a sense, a desecration. Consciousness has no specific site in the brain. Nonetheless, insofar as it can be regionalized, it is more localized in our frontal lobes than any place else. Tumors of our frontal lobes will often first manifest themselves by a diminished awareness and alertness, and hence a diminished capacity to solve complex problems. The sciences of anthropology and neuroanatomy strongly suggest that the direction of all evolution is toward the development of the frontal lobes, and hence the development of consciousness. But the Bible and mythology also have much to teach about the evolution of human consciousness. The great myth of Genesis 3, one of the most complicated and multidimensional myths about our humanity, provides us with another major hint. In it, God forbade Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Instead, they gave in to temptation, urged by a fallen angel, we are told. In their disobedience, they hid from God. When God asked why they were hiding, they explained it was because they were naked. Who told you you were naked? God asked, and the secret was out. In other words, the first result of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that Adam and Eve became shy or modest because they were now self-conscious. They were aware that they were naked.
From this we can extrapolate that the emotions of guilt and shame are manifestations of consciousness. And although both emotions can be exaggerated to the point of pathology, within limits they are an essential part of our humanity and necessary for our psychological development and functioning. So Genesis 3 is a myth of evolution, and specifically of human evolution into consciousness. Like other myths, it is an embodiment of truth. When we humans became self-conscious, we became conscious of ourselves as separate entities. We lost that sense of oneness with nature and the rest of creation. This loss is symbolized by our banishment from paradise. And inevitably, as Adam and Eve developed a higher level of self-awareness, they arrived at a realization that consequences follow actions and that their choices would be forever burdensome by virtue of the responsibility entailed. All of humanity has inherited this predicament. We have all been thrust into the desert of maturity. Thus there is a far more profound implication of our evolution into consciousness than just guilt or shame. It is when we are conscious that we have free will. More than anything else, I believe, what is meant by God creating us in His own image is that through the evolutionary process, He gave us free will. There is no free will when we are operating at a purely reflexive or instinctual level. As soon as God, our evolution, gave us free will, he immediately let loose the potential for human evil in the world. If there is no choice, there is no evil. If one is to have free will, then one must have the power to choose between good and evil. And one is as free to choose the evil as the good. So it strikes me as no accident that the very next thing that happened in the story was an example of evil. In Genesis 4, Cain murders Abel. Was it nothing more than a matter of free will that he chose to do so? When God asked Cain where Abel was, he replied with a question, Am I my brother's keeper? We can recognize this as a gross rationalization, representing defensive thinking. It is extremely shallow, almost reflexive thinking. This gives us a hint that Cain murdered Abel because he chose not to think more deeply. With free will, we have the choice to think or to not think, or to think deeply or to think shallowly. But why would someone choose not to think deeply? Why would someone choose to think only simplistically, superficially, and reflexively? The answer is that despite our consciousness, what we have in common with other creatures is a preference to avoid pain. To think deeply is often more painful than thinking shallowly. The pain involved may not make consciousness seem worthwhile or good until you consider some of the prices we pay for failing to grow in consciousness or to think with integrity. There is much evil in the world. Unnecessary individual suffering, tremendous damage to human relations, and societal chaos due to our failures to think and grow in consciousness. While important distinctions are to be made between evil and insanity, illness and sin, I wrote in People of the Lie that to name something correctly gives us a certain amount of power over it. I believe that evil can be defined as a specific form of mental illness and should be subject to at least the same intensity of scientific investigation that we would devote to some other major psychiatric disease. Yet it is still evil. Auschwitz and Milai and Jonestown and the Oklahoma City bombing are actual incidents. Evil is not a figment of the imagination of some primitive religious mind attempting to explain the unknown. 
There is widespread denial of this in our country. Many downplay or hesitate to see evil for what it truly is, in part because they don't want to appear to be acting arrogant or holier than thou. Indeed, it is quite common to read newspaper articles that describe those who commit a range of human atrocities as simply sick. As a psychiatrist, I believe the word sick is more appropriately applied to those who are afflicted with something for which treatment or a cure is possible and also desired. Although evil people are operating from a sick perspective, the difference is that many of those who are sick deal with their venom internally, turning it painfully upon themselves if they choose not to seek help. Those who are evil go another way. They fail to suffer because they lash out at others and use them as scapegoats. It is the people around them who must suffer. Of course, an evil deed does not an evil person make. Otherwise, we would all be designated as evil because we all do evil things. But I believe it would be a mistake to think of sin or evil as simply a matter of degree. Sinning is most broadly defined as missing the mark, which means we sin every time we fail to hit the bullseye. Sin is nothing less than a failure to be continually perfect. And because it is impossible for us to be continually perfect, we are all sinners. Carl Jung ascribed the root of human evil to what he called the refusal to meet the shadow. By the shadow, Jung meant the part of our mind that contains those things that we would rather not own up to, that we are continually trying to hide from ourselves and others, and sweep under the rug of our consciousness. Those who are evil refuse to bear the pain of guilt or to allow the shadow into consciousness and meet it. Instead, they will set about, often at great effort, militantly trying to destroy the evidence of their sin, or anyone who speaks of it or represents it. And in this act of destruction, their evil is committed. Traditional Freudian psychology has taught us that the causes of most psychological disorders stem from hidden feelings feelings of anger, unacknowledged sexual desire, etc. Because of this, psychological illness has been localized in the unconscious realm by most thinkers, as if the unconscious were the seat of psychopathology and symptoms were like subterranean demons that surfaced to torment the individual. My own view is the opposite. I believe that all psychological disorders are basically disorders of consciousness. They are not rooted in the unconscious, but in a conscious mind that refuses to think and is unwilling to deal with certain issues, bear certain feelings, or tolerate pain. These issues, feelings, or desires are in the unconscious only because a pain-avoiding conscious mind has thrust them there. Of course, no one walking around is so unhealthy that he is not at least slightly conscious, and no one is so healthy that she is totally conscious. But perhaps the best measure of the degree of consciousness can be found in the consistency of a person's general approach to thinking. For example, a person who is oriented more toward thinking simplistically has a lesser degree of consciousness than a person who thinks with integrity. In this way, thinking and consciousness are inextricably locked together in a parallel relationship, and the search for greater consciousness is the foundation of mental and spiritual growth. It is through this growth that we become ever more competent. Although we can pinpoint various capabilities and talents that allow us to meet the demands of life or to develop a deafness in problem-solving skills, 
General competence is a much more complex capability. True competence is more about growing in wisdom than mere knowledge. It entails striving toward a psychological and spiritual maturity that results in real personal power. One way of talking about this progression of awareness or consciousness is in terms of what is known as ego development. In a world waiting to be born, I wrote that the ego is the governing part of our personality and its development. In early childhood, the ego is totally down at the level of the emotions and totally enmeshed with them. When children are joyful, they are 100% joyful. When they are sad, they are 100% sad, sometimes to the point of being inconsolable. The capacity for self-awareness very gradually increases throughout childhood. In adolescence, however, it undergoes a dramatic growth spurt. For the first time, young people have a quite obvious observing ego. Now they can observe themselves being joyful or sad or angry when they are feeling so. This means that the ego is no longer wholly confined to the level of the emotions. Now a part of it, the observing ego, is detached from the emotions, above them looking on. There is a certain resulting loss of spontaneity. Since self-consciousness often becomes painful at this stage of psychosocial spiritual development, Many people move into adulthood forsaking rather than continuing its development. When, unwittingly, the majority settle for a limited, even diminished, awareness of their own feelings and imperfections, they have stopped short on the journey of personal growth, thereby failing to fulfill their human potential or grow into true psychospiritual power. But a fortunate minority, for reasons both mysterious and graceful, continue the journey, ever strengthening their observing egos rather than allowing them to atrophy. Exercising the observing ego is crucial because if it becomes strong enough, the individual is then in a position where she can proceed to the next stage and develop what I call a transcendent ego. With a transcendent ego, we become more aware of our broader dimensions, better prepared to realistically decide when, where, and why to express the essence of who we are. In becoming more conscious of the full range of our thoughts and feelings, we inevitably become less threatened by the knowledge of our flaws and can more readily integrate and appreciate the whole of who we are the good and the bad. Yet once again, in the interest of reality, we must remember that all blessings are potential curses and that both consciousness and competence are inextricably interwoven with pain. In The Price of Greatness, Arnold Ludwig examined the lives of 1,004 eminent figures of the 20th century who represented various disciplines including artists, writers, inventors, and other creative individuals. In exploring the relationship between genius and mental health, Ludwig wrote that among the common elements of the great geniuses of our times, all showed a readiness to discard prevalent views, irreverence toward established authority, a strong capacity for solitude, and a psychological unease which could cause mental trouble, such as depression, anxiety, or alcoholism. But if these qualities were not too incapacitating, they actually contributed to the individual's ability to achieve significant creativity, blaze new trails, propose radical solutions, and promote new schools of thought. One aspect of the pain of being gifted and highly conscious has to do with the struggle to come to terms with one's superiority. As I wrote in A World Waiting to be Born, many who are truly superior will struggle against their genius call 
to personal and civil power because they reject the calling from fear of exercising authority. Usually, they are reluctant to consider themselves better than or above others, due in large part to a sense of humility that accompanies their personal and spiritual power. Yet another painful burden that comes with increased consciousness and competence is the loneliness of transcending traditional culture. Throughout the ages, there have been only a few among millions, a Socrates or a Jesus, who have obviously risen above the rigidity of culture and simplistic thinking of their times. Now, as a result of mass communications, psychotherapy, and grace, I would estimate that there are many thousands of adults in our country who are on this cutting edge. But deep thinkers are often misunderstood by the masses who continue to view life and the world simplistically. Since many who are conscious do not readily buy into the go-along-to-get-along mentality that is prevalent in society, they find it hard to fit neatly into the mainstream. They pay a price of feeling at least partially alienated from families, and isolated from old friends and cultural rituals. There is still another pain of consciousness, so great and so important that it warrants even deeper consideration. I refer to our consciousness of death and dying. In our death-denying and youth-worshipping culture, we go to great lengths to avoid facing even the smallest reminders of death. The path of health and healing is the opposite from that of the denial of death. Whether young or old, a deep consciousness of death ultimately leads us on a path toward seeking meaning. Inherent in this is that we must come to terms with the reality of change, which requires adjustments all the time in the way we think and behave, and particularly when we have become the most comfortable with where we are. And change often feels like dying, like death. I have suggested many reasons to grow in consciousness, but we can always ask more radical questions. If one reason is to find meaning, what meaning are we seeking? The more we can become conscious, the more we will grow in power and competence. But to what purpose? Granted that the whole thrust of evolution is in the direction of consciousness, but where are we evolving toward? Nothing will ever remove all mystery, but I believe at least part of the answer to these questions can be found in the Latin derivation of the word conscious, which is conscire, meaning literally to know with. What a strange derivative! To know with? To know with what? I suggest that the answer is to know with God. I have said that psychological disorders primarily have their root in consciousness rather than our unconscious. That nasty material is contained in our unconscious only because our conscious mind refuses to deal with it. If we can deal with this unpleasant stuff, then our unconscious mind offers an absolute garden of delights through which we are connected to God. In other words, I believe that God reveals herself to us through our unconscious if we are willing to be open to it and conscious of its wisdom. 